you're on the ah, there you go. Are you serious? We can try it again. I think it's for some reason not giving me permission. And I know we had trouble last time with it. Yeah, I think it might go live the moment you start the webinar. I think okay. that's when it well, we'll might see. allow. Might. Okay, perfect. Let's see. I don't know. All right. So let's we're gonna try it then. We may have to um do the volume right away. So we're gonna we're gonna start the webinar and you guys are just gonna let people this is gonna let people in the room. So you can just say hello, welcome. We're live, everybody. So as people let people load in. People entering, yeah. So you'll start to see, um, you'll start to see that you know people yeah. are entering. So you just say, "Oh, come on, come, we'll get started in a moment." Yep. Uh, welcome everyone. We're gonna start in a few moments. So. <laughs> It's that. Okay, awesome. So what we want to do, guys, is you're going to go here. Um, oh, sorry. You're going to go to. Okay. Well, we should be able to. I should be able to click on her. Oh, it's because I've got to add you as a co-host, and I got to pay it to the media view. That I understand. <laughs> then you want to make that. Hey everyone, and welcome to the National Biodiversity Teach-In 2024. I'm Vinay Jose. And I'm Rune Jandran, and we'll introduce our first presenter of the day. Dr. Sharma is the Director of Science and Conservation of International Snow Leopards. He also serves as the International Coordinator of the Global Snow Leopard and Ecosystem Protection Program, an intergovernmental coalition of 12 countries where snow leopards are found. He's also based in Kyrgyzstan, which is 12 hours ahead of us in time zone. So literally on the other side of the globe. Dr. Sharma, take it away. Thank you. Thank you, Vinay. Thank you, Arun. Such a pleasure meeting you guys again this year. I don't know which year is this, but uh, this, is a, this is one of the regular events I look forward to every year. It's where I sort of try to bring together a lot of research that has taken place over the last year. And I try to compile it and uh, share it with, with you all. All right, let me try and share my screen. And can you please confirm if you can see my screen now? Three, two, one. Yeah. Do you see the screen now? Oh, uh, yes. We do. Fantastic. I'm just going to make one more little change here so that the videos play all right. optimize for video okay. okay um i'm assuming you guys can see my screen still you just say yes and then i'll start yep we can still see your screen fantastic thank you thank you arun thank you uh vinay uh and good morning everyone uh just to reiterate i want to thank you all for inviting me to talk to this wonderful group of students teachers uh and uh even family members, as I've heard in the past. Uh, last year, I remember speaking about snow leopards and climate change. And a lot has happened in the last one year, especially with regards to technology. We, we have seen a dramatic, uh, dramatic change in terms of the way we use technology with the advent of AI. So I thought it might be fun to talk about technology uh, in today's session and specifically how we uh, at the Snow Leopard Trust are using technology to understand the behavior of an otherwise rare and elusive species. And that happens to be the Snow Leopard. Now, I'd like to start with the story of uh, Bayad e uh, It was a Bayad Ekhoshar was the name of a snow leopard uh, who was made famous by uh, the BBC film called Beyond the Myth way back in 2005. I'm sure many of you hadn't even, uh, uh, weren't even born at that time. Uh, Bayad was uh, known for her intriguing ranging and behavioral patterns. 
She used to spend several weeks next to a busy road in Chitral, Pakistan. This allowed numerous people to not only see her, but also film and photograph her like never before, from being an extremely elusive and rarely filmed species this was probably one of the first few good quality visuals that uh, were ever shown on public TV. The Snow Leopard Trust had an active programmatic partnership in Pakistan, uh, has had an active partnership since 1995. And as part of the Snow Leopard Trust and its country partners research program, Bayad was collared uh, in 2005. And when the color was put, uh, was deployed on her, many people, including media, spared no words in criticizing it. We received a lot of hate mail for tagging a snow leopard uh, with what they called as an ugly collar and ugly ear tags. The argument was that uh, the snow leopard could be observed from the road for extended periods. Why did you need to uh, put a collar on them? So while I would agree with them that these ear tags were at that time unnecessary, uh, which was, of, of course, taken into consideration for any future uh, coloring, there was, uh, there, there was something magical that we, we were about to find. When, when Bayad was colored, we, most of the people said that, you know, you'll be seeing her moving around the same place where, where she has been seen by people. There's nothing new you're going to find. Now... Uh, Bayad wore that collar for about a year. Unfortunately, on one hand, technology was not that well developed uh, to communicate between the collar and the satellite. So the collar failed to communicate the data back to the sat satellite. However, GPS technology was fairly uh, advanced at that moment, so it was able to still record the locations. So what was happening was Bayad's collar was con constantly receiving data from the GPS satellites and recording them on board every few hours. But there was another communication uh, module which had to transmit the data back and that wasn't really working. The caller also had a radio transmitter that could be used to hear a radio signal from the caller, but then it required line of sight. And I, to be honest, I'm yet to come across a person who is fit enough to be able to keep a snow leopard in their light, line of sight for extended periods, given the landscape that they live in. And on this massive landscape, this is where the snow leopard is. And you can imagine the kind of terrain we are talking about. Um, in fact, uh, the terrain is such that the first person to have done his PhD on snow leopards, uh, Dr. Raghu Chundavat from India, he had to discontinue his plan to collar snow leopards after collaring one in Ladakh, uh, he, he basically claimed that he was ending up estimating his own home range than that of the snow leopard. So he decided not to color anymore. Anyway, a year later, uh, at least one, uh, there was another device on the collar which worked and which allowed the collar to be uh, disengaged automatically. It fell somewhere in, in these mountains, as you can see here. Uh, it took three agonizing months for the field teams to retrieve the collar. And uh, when they downloaded the data, that's where the magic came, uh, became evident. That one cat, that one snow leopard Bayad, who was spending weeks in front of a busy road, was covering an area that we had no clue belonged to her. She was traversing across ridge lines, canyons, pastures, valleys, villages, and much more. We found that she was ranging across 1,400 square kilometers which is not just, I mean, it, not, not just one country. She was actually covering a range which extended from Pakistan to Afghanistan. In other words, Bayad was one of the first snow leopards to tell us that we needed landscapes to look at rather than smaller protected areas or smaller uh, pockets to work in. We needed to look beyond human-made boundaries if we had to conserve snow leopards. Now, Bayad is not the only snow leopard to have done that. Uh, we have so far collared and successfully tracked 37 uh, snow leopards in Mongolia. Other scientists have done similar but smaller research projects in other, other countries by following snow leopards with much more sophisticated and efficient collars than, uh, than what were available 
way back in uh, in 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 2005 we have found that cats in mongolia cross over to russia those collared in nepal move between china india and bhutan those in tajikistan cross over to afghanistan and all the way try to sneak into pakistan and so on basically what we know is that as a species uh whose one third of the distribution range is within 100 kilometers of uh, international borders, snow leopards move between countries without the need of any passports or visas. Of course, as long as the borders do not have fences that pre pre prevent them from crossing over. Uh, we've, now, I've had the good fortune of working with the uh, Snow Leopard Trust, uh, helping study and uh, conserve these species. Uh, that's not only extremely rare to spot, but also blessed by evolution to strive in some of the world's most difficult mountains. And as you just saw here, it's a species that is custom designed to be able to hunt down uh, prey at extremely difficult in a, an extremely difficult terrain. Just watch this snow leopard at it runs at breakneck speed uh, downhill, maneuvering itself and using its tail as a rudder and a counterbalance so that it's able to uh, make those uh, quick turns left and right. And eventually uh, it leads to the uh, to that little Uriel falling down that cliff. And then of course, it just walks down later, almost at leisure as if coming down and picking up its pound meat from the grocery store. Yeah, that's what had happened to that little uh, Uriel out there. And comes a snow leopard, picks it up, and takes it back. Now, the species is known for its ability to uh, wear an invisibility cloak that puts the most clever stealth masters to shame. You'll be surprised to note that there is not one or two, but three snow leopards in this image, and yet they remain very difficult, almost impossible to be seen. And I, rather than uh, letting you go through it, I'm just going to make it easier for you. You have one pair of snow leopards, two cats there uh, at the uh, center low, lower part of the screen and one towards the top right corner of the screen out here. There, we just zoom into them and then let's zoom in, zoom out into them again. So that's where the cats are. Okay, now how do you study the behavior of a species that is so elusive. We use technology, uh, we use statistics, and that's what has really helped us improve our understanding of what snow leopards need. Uh, things have, I mean, technology has really, really dr grown, improved dramatically over the last 20 years. Uh, you know, statistical prowess has become accessible, uh, has made it accessible for us to con to, to do conservation, but uh, it's also allowed us to, to co-evolve the questions that we can ask uh, uh, from, uh, from such a difficult subject. Uh, what I'm gonna do is, given we have little time today, I'll give a fleeting glimpse of where and how we are using technology and mathematics to make us understand behavioral aspects of a species that is otherwise difficult to observe. I'll also highlight directions in which we think some of the development is likely, uh, to, likely to take place to improve our understanding of these enigmatic species. So to begin with, it wasn't until technology filled the evolutionary gap between snow leopards and humans that we really began understanding the species better. Uh, you all must have, in fact, I just mentioned to you about the GPS collars. These devices have come a long way from the past, uh, uh, over the past couple of decades. Today, these are equipped with 3D accelerometers. That might have, yeah, they have, they have a 3D accelerometer, smartphone, radio transmitter, digital thermometer, GPS receiver, inbuilt memory card, and whatnot. Everything gets packed in that little uh, cuboid that uh, hangs on the, uh, around their neck. These devices provide some of the highest resolution information about the movement, activity, and life events of snow leopards. But telemetry is not only expensive, 
it is also risky for the researchers and the animals alike, which is why we 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 only have roughly I think fifty or fifty five animals collared till date across the snow leopard range. Out of these, imagine thirty five are collared at just one site, which is the Tost uh, long term research program in South Kobe in Mongolia. Despite the highest resolution of information they provide, we cannot go around coloring everywhere for various reasons, costs, uh, practicality, and other considerations uh, you know, included. It's practically, technically, and monetarily impossible to go around coloring everywhere. So which is where we talk about the one of the most incredible inventions of the 21st century, which is the digital camera trap. I specified digital camera trap and I, I, I highlight digital because there was no way I or any other researcher would have been able to hike thousands of meters every day or every second day to change film rolls uh, on those old time analog cameras. Uh, again, many of you may not even know, but cameras used to have a film roll until about 20 years ago. And each camera roll could just take about 36 pictures. Then you take the roll out put a new roll and then get those processed in a, in a, in a laboratory. Uh, now, ever since digital camera traps uh, came up, the, the digital cameras came up, that has stopped being, that has ceased to be a constraint. These camera traps are honestly like, uh, like minions in the mountains that don't complain about temperature or rain while collecting high quality photographic data for us all the time. But then, while they are relatively affordable and provide outstanding data on presence and abundance about snow leopards, they don't really have feet. And hence, they are contingent to where the researcher deploys them. Uh, in the past several years, we have come across less than half a dozen occasions when a snow leopard has been seen with a kill. Like you see in this uh, picture, a snow leopard is coming back to its uh, penthouse uh, with a marmot in its mouth. And this is one of the few images we have from across the snow leopard range, the million square, uh, uh, almost a couple of million square kilometers, where we have any data about, uh, where we have any pictures of snow leopards carrying, uh, carrying prey in their mouth. And uh, not to mention some parts of the snow leopard range are so volatile that setting up a camera trap can make security forces as well as armed militants uh, pretty upset. This is where poop and pea science has come to the rescue. Uh, snow leopard pieces are a ball full of data. Uh, and yes, uh, that's what I really meant. They're a ball full of data about which provides information about their health, family, diet, hormones, and much more. Uh, that's a scat, a fresh scat of a snow leopard that you can see out there. Um, now let let me let me go through some simple examples of how different technological and statistical tools are helping us understand snow leopards better. And it's not only once you understand them better that you will have a better chance of protecting them, uh, for you will then know what snow leopards really need. One of the most standard uses of GPS collars is to estimate species home ranges. Now, with more than 100,000 GPS locations from dozens of individuals uh, collared over the past decade, a couple of decades, we have some of the most in-depth knowledge about snow leopard movement and behavior. Just for comparison's sake, if you look here, uh, we now know that male home ranges are typically as big as Manhattan, uh, where, whereas female range in roughly of that area. So that's a male home range, roughly the size of Manhattan. And the females, of course, would be half that size. Uh, but then what we also now know is that these ranges are not static. These range sizes are also not static. They're as dynamic as it gets. Here's a crude comparison of two males living in the same area across different periods of time. The black circle is where a male was ranging in a year, about two years ago. Whereas the red circle is where another male was ranging about 10 years ago. What changed between the two time periods? 
the number of snow leopards using the landscape has grown over the past 10 years due to various conservation efforts. But how do we know that the number has changed? Well, you can't answer them, answer that with telemetry data alone, or you will only be able to call her a small fraction of the available cats at a time. And that's where we use camera traps, the minions that I mentioned to you about. These camera traps, when in the field, they can record high quality images of snow leopards that we then try to identify as individuals. And then we try to get an estimate of a minimum population uh, size based on that. Now that just tells us how many individuals or at least how many individuals are there in a population. It's still not telling us how many snow leopards are there in the entire population. Uh, and again, as I mentioned earlier, we may not have the luxury of camera trapping everywhere. There ought to be areas which might be inaccessible or too dangerous to leave out leave out uh, leave our camera trap minions uh, in which case we've got to rely on poop or genetic markers um and, uh, and 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 lastly of course as i mentioned not all snow leopards will be as lucky to have their selfies taken or their poop collected by researchers and when that happens this is where we use statistical inference and sophisticated modeling techniques such as uh, spatial capture recapture framework to estimate which individuals are living in an area, have cameras around them, but for some reason have failed to get their selfie taken on these camera traps. And once we know which how many individuals are in the population and which never got photographed, we can always use them as a correction factor to come up with the final number of how many snow leopards are there in the population. And that's how we come up with reliable, replicable uh, estimates of snow leopard abundance or density in a certain area. As in another example, let me mention here, telemetry helps us figure when females give birth. Now, a female would uplink like a cluster of locations, you know, they're, they're uplinking locations every five hours. And when the when a lot of locations are uplinking in a small area, for an extended period of time, uh, it clearly means that at, you know they're returning to the specific location in a distinct pattern. When researchers spot that pattern, they can start predicting that uh, you know the stock has paid a visit to the mountains. But then uh, tiny cubs cannot be collared. Uh, we cannot figure out when the mother starts venturing around with her cubs, and that's where we can only that's something we can only figure with the help of our camera minions. So basically, I'm just going back and forth between telemetry and camera minions is because I just want to highlight how different technological tools and of course, poop science again, different technological tools, they interface and they can be used to uh, to to understand or to improve our understanding, to augment the kind of data we're generating from each of them and understand them better. But again, here also, we don't know, um, you know, why some snow leopards never get photographed again between see between different years in the same area, whereas we keep photographing them in other areas for maybe eight years or nine years uh, uh, at a stretch. So imagine when a snow leopard is growing up, it has to disperse. It has to find either find uh, its own home range or it has to move somewhere else to find its own home range. If it has to find a home range where it grew up, it has to fight for it. If, if it has to go to another area and find a home range, either it has to find an empty home range or it has to really travel long distance to be able to find that home range. Uh, oops. Sorry, give me a second. Hold on. You guys still see my screen? Back. Oh, yeah, we're able to see your screen. Thank you. I'm sorry. I, I just had a plug come off. Okay. So basically, even though camera traps can be used wide, widely, we cannot have them set up across endless habitats. And that prevents our ability to determine how far snow leopards disperse or how our populations connected and which areas must be preserved as corridors. 
So, you know, there's, 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 a, there's a lot that's going on, which uh, we can only understand by a combination of methods and techniques which help us augment our understanding. Now, coming back to telemetry, it generates valuable data which has allowed us to, to get fascinating insights about, for example, something as simple as mother-cub interaction. Now, you all are going to schools, your parents must be watching or your teachers must be watching. Uh, I can say that without any hesitation that snow leopard moms are among the best teachers and mothers of all the cats or the most, more, more than best, I would say they're the most dedicated mothers and teachers of all the big cats. And the reason I say that is, uh, is here. Uh, let me plot the age at which cubs wean away from their mother, which means, so cubs stay with their moms for a certain period of time. And because to take care of a cub is a lot of investment, you know, mom has to hunt more often, has to protect the cubs all the time. So there's a lot of investment that goes into raising a cub and the moms do that, but they can't keep on doing it forever. The cubs have to go their own way and find their own, uh, you know, find their own ranges and, and start living on their own, hunt, making their own kills. So if we plot the age at which cubs separate from their moms and find their own way, uh, and then on the x-axis, if we plot the body weight, you will notice there is almost a pattern. As the, as the cat's size, body size increases, the amount, number of months the cubs stay with mom also increase almost in a systematic pattern. Tiger being a big, 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 big cat, it, uh, its cubs st stay with the, uh, with the mom for a very long time. Smaller for jaguar and cougars and lynx and so on. But look at the snow leopard out here. It's an outlier. It's one of the smallest of the big cats, but it takes care of its cubs for the longest period of time, even longer than what a tiger does. Now, this kind of, a, uh, you know, uh, this kind of, a, it's, it's almost like an outlier. And what's causing that? Well, imagine a snow leopard really spending 22 months with those uh, meat guzzling cubs it clearly makes the snow leopard one of those uh, incredible moms and, and teachers. And there could be many factors, but two of them could be one, that snow leopards uh, uh, breed only in a small period of time. So the cubs have the luxury of hanging around the mom for a slightly longer period of time than they might become independent. But on the other side, it takes a lot of skill to be able to hunt in those treacherous mountains. You just saw how that snow leopard was hunting down uh, the mountain. There are similar uh, uh, skills that snow leopards need. And probably it takes a little longer in case of a snow leopard to learn all those skills. Now, imagine over the past 15 years, we've collared 37 snow leopards in Mongolia, but only three pairs of mother offspring. And here on the left side, what you're seeing right now is how a male and a male cub is moving about with its mom. That's where it separates and just takes a jump across a step, almost a desert, and weans away and populates a new mountain range. On the right hand side, what you're seeing is a mother and a female cub, whereas even after weaning away, the, the female cub hangs around where the mom is. So she has a slightly greater level of tolerance. Uh, she, she enjoys a slightly greater level of tolerance than what the male does. Male really has to get to explore long distance to find new home. The females can still hang around the mother's uh, or their own natal range. And, uh, but then the problem is we still, we only have data from just three, three such uh, pairs. And we don't know whether it's a pattern or a random occurrence. The only way we will learn more is through systematic data. Uh, and of course, uh, that data can most easily become available through camera trapping in, the, in one way or the other, where we have so far managed to monitor 12 mother offspring pairs. So with telemetry, we have monitored only three, but with camera trapping, we know of at least 12 such pairs where we no have known the cubs growing up with their mom photographed on different loca at different locations and different time. And then we know that they have, must have separated because then they started getting photographed elsewhere. 
Uh, the only problem with camera traps is that they are installed at fixed locations and can only provide limited information about when, which cat which visited, which camera location to get its selfie taken. Uh, to project this information into usable ranging parameters, we again look up to statistics and some of those sophisticated models that I mentioned about that guide us to understand how the boys and the girls disperse after separating from their moms. Going forward, we will be able to use this information to understand how ranges are acquired and established by dispersing individuals. And it's an important lesson to, to learn because when populations improve, when your conservation work improves, the snow leopard population cannot increase endlessly. There is a threshold that it will reach when the prey, the food that it has, will become a, a, a limiting uh, factor. And then they will have to start looking elsewhere. When they start looking elsewhere, this is where we need to understand how they disperse so that conservation practices, corridors around certain landscapes can be protected and conserved accordingly. Now, quickly moving to what snow leopards eat. In the past several years, we have come across less than half a dozen occasions when a snow leopard has been seen by the kid. And that's what I mentioned a few minutes ago. Uh, with telemetry, we have been able to determine with great confidence what snow leopards eat, when they eat, and how often they eat. Uh, here is a particularly intriguing data set that you're seeing uh, animating on the screen uh, from one particular, uh, in fact, they are, they are multiple individuals, but you can see these little dots are when the snow leopard, which is in red, is capturing, is catching and, and eating up the ibex, which is the one of the primary prey. And as you can see, the snow leopards, they, they almost kill uh, or they hunt down prey at clockwork frequency. Yeah, it was a bit sad to have lost uh, a couple of these hard colored, very difficult. I mean, it's much, it's probably slightly more difficult to color ibex. A prey animal than it is to call her snow leopards, but they had to have lost them to snow leopards. It was a bit sad, but then it's fascinating and incredibly valuable information as well. Uh, but again, the problem is we only find kill sites based on when a snow leopard keeps coming back to the same location. Now it gives a great while it gives us a great insight into hunting and eating behavior of a snow leopard with respect to large prey. What if it's killed a a, 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 ch a chukar or a small partridge, or it has killed a hare, or it has killed one of those mammoths. They're like half, you know, half. I mean, they're like uh, snacks, right? They might kill them multiple times. So you you eat a lot of snacks and then you fill yourself up. So that might work as well. So while the, this cluster method can tell us a lot about when and what large size prey they are eating. It tells us very little about their dependence on other plants and animals, including birds and rodents. Uh, and although historically we have been assessing diets based on what they call as a microhistological analysis, where basically they just collect poop, uh, find out pieces of uh, find out remains of hair, and then uh, look through the microscopes and try to identify which hair belongs to which species. They have reference slides and then they say, okay, this is the species. So then we know which species a snow leopard has eaten. Uh, the problem is you still might miss out some of the smaller uh, smaller species. And this is where genetics is allowing us to go further and estimate diet with much gra greater precision than it was possible in the past. Okay, so far so good. We are making great progress in understanding species with the help of technology. But here from this platform, you know, I mean, just want to mention, and I mentioned it to you students, uh, because you, many of you will, will take up engineering as your professions. Many of you might, uh, you know, go in different streams. You don't need to be a, an ecologist or a biologist to help snow leopards. Whatever you're doing, wherever you are, there is an opportunity to, uh, to be able to help conserve snow leopards. And in this case, think about uh, 
you know the possibilities that we have uh, of using technology and different uh, tools. And I'm just going to give you a very brief uh, example of how we had a very interesting partnership with Microsoft and what it led to. So here's a 20 second uh, shameless plug of an advertisement that was aired in 2018 all over US and Europe. There it goes. Snow leopards are almost impossible to find, but we need to know where they are because they are threatened. Our camera traps allow us to have an eye in the mountains, taking thousands of pictures. Microsoft AI scans through all these images and separates snow leopards from everything else. In 10 minutes, instead of 10 days, it gives us time to do better research and save this threatened species. Right. So while, and, and these were early days of image recognition, uh, deep neural networks, uh, now we're using them everywhere. Your Google phones are using them to recognize your facial picture. Uh, your, your, uh, you know, using it for face recognition, image recognition. You just upload an image and it just tells you what you're looking at. But these were early days and a lot of development did happen with some of the snow leopard data that we were able to share. Going forward, we not only hope AI to be able to identify species, but also start identifying these spot patterns, which are unique. Each snow leopard has a diff different spot pattern and AI will have the ability, but it does have the ability to learn how to individual, how to identify individuals. Uh, it's still at its nascent stage, but hopefully in the next couple of years, we might be able to do that with the help of AI as well. Drones, we all know about, uh, about the use of drones for various things, uh, their evolution has been incredibly dramatic. And we had hoped to use them to understand prey distributions, you know, where ibex and other species are, uh, because snow leopard populations are very tightly linked to the food availability. Uh, unfortunately, so far, we've only managed to crash them into cliffs due to sudden gush of wind or lose signal as soon as they uh, get around a bend uh, in the mountains, not to mention uh, the heat sensors from the rock, uh, the heat sensors read the rocks to be the same as the ibex, as you can see in this image right in front of you. There are ibex standing there, and then there are rocks right next to them. The infrared sensor doesn't really recognize them as something different, not yet. Uh, so yes, uh, and of course, uh, I mentioned genetics, now, there's genomic work going on. We've just uh, submitted a, a publication, uh, a paper for publication, which is, uh, which has decoded the entire snow leopard genome. And it's going to make a lot of genetic analysis on snow leopards much more replicable and easier. Uh, uh, replicable, is replicable, reliable, and also cheaper. And... Uh, that's where that's where things are developing and moving forward. So to be honest, the world's a great place today and the integration of technology into understanding animal behavior has, is truly unlocking avenues that have long remained unavailable to us. Uh, what I do want to however highlight is that we don't need to look at a single solution panacea, but instead look at combining technologies and using mathematics and statistics and uh, and and uh, even uh, art forms in many ways uh, to overcome these gaps uh, uh, that they leave between uh, different uh, data points. At the end, I would like to also highlight that technology is a powerful ally for conservation, but then with great power comes great responsibility. And if you think this is a, a Spider-Man quote, let me correct you. It's a very old quote uh, from the French Revolution in the 18th century. And that's where uh, uh, that's when it was uh, publicized. Uh, but the, the fact is that when you have access to technology, it's 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 really, you know, you, you've got all it's like a superpower. You have to be very careful that it does not get misused. For instance, some of these camera traps can get pictures of humans on uh, uh, 
who are completely unaware that they're getting photographed. So for instance, they can have trem tremendous repercussions on the local communities who use that landscape for their own purpose, uh, local authorities and also researchers. Uh, so what we did was we did brainstorm the whole idea and and uh, come up uh, we did come up with a uh, with with some guidance on how to deal with the ethical conundrums of human encounter on let's say these camera traps as you can imagine you know some sometimes you're bound by law to report an illegal trespassing whereas on other times your and your equipment safety will depend on how you handle these encounters uh so this is not like a holy grail but it's like a general advisory where researchers can look into these seven different elements and plan and implement their research programs accordingly now these are these are like you know these are like uh, the guidelines that you should have any any development you, know, you you bring a new you buy a new television you have its guidelines and it has a list of do's and don'ts Similarly, when you are deploying new technology, when you're using technology to, to understand something, you always need to have some of those guidelines along with that. And that's the hope with some of these uh, guidances. It will really help us remain, uh, help us prevent technology from being misused. And I think that's a really critical point. Uh, with that, uh, I'd like to thank you all very much for joining in today. I think we may have a few minutes. Uh, yeah, we might have almost 20 minutes today to uh, for Q question and answers. Uh, I don't promise I'll have answers to all of them, but I can certainly assure uh, to find, uh, to try my best to answer them. Let me get back to the Q&A session. Uh, there you go. Okay. Um, <laughs> my uh, Brittany Mallon is asking, what is your favorite memory of studying snow leopards? So my favorite memory of studying snow leopards is, to be honest, the time when I encountered a snow leopard uh, literally uh, face to face. I, I, was, I was on a little uh, overhanging rock, uh, on, on, on a rock, almost like a ridge line. And suddenly a snow leopard just climbs up and finds me standing right in front of it. We were less than less than uh, maybe a couple of meters away from each other, and uh, I was frozen. And this cat looked at me with big round eyes, almost as if exclaiming, "That how did you get so close to me? I didn't even notice you were here." And then, of course, looked at me, turned around, and just walked away. So I think that was one of my most favorite uh, yeah, encounters or memories of having worked with small efforts. <laughs> Uh, again, another question from Brittany. How often are you able to go out into the field? So it really varies and it has changed a lot with changing responsibilities. Uh, when I started, I used to spend considerable time in the field, maybe three to four months a year. It's gone down to maybe about a month or month and a half, but shorter uh, multiple trips uh, into the field. But yes, Whenever there is an opportunity, I try not to miss it because uh, ultimately, it's that's what uh, that's what keeps you going. You know, every field day is a different it is a different day at office, and uh, yeah, I wouldn't want to miss a single opportunity that I have to be able to uh, enjoy it to the fullest. Uh, we have another question. Hold on, let me just remove these. Yeah. Uh, now we have a question from someone with the with the ID Enviro 2. Uh, there's a trendy video of a snow leopard falling down a mountain. Uh, what is the mort mortality rate of them when they are hunting? We don't really have an answer how what is the mortality rate, but that video you're talking about, if I'm not mistaken, it's the same where it's basically chasing down a, a blue sheep and then they both fall down. That snow leopard survived after falling down, uh, it basically spent two days eating that blue sheep that it had hunted down. And uh, that does not preclude the possibility of them dying as well. They do fall off the cliffs once in a while. We do find occasionally snow leopards which have injured themselves fatally, 
but uh, I can't really answer how how often they they fall. Uh, but yes, uh, the 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 risks, uh, you know, the stakes are very high, and these are not easy mountains uh, to to hunt in. Why did you start studying snow leopards? I'll, I'll, I'll divide it into, into, into two parts. One, of course, uh, I was very fortunate to have gotten this opportunity to study snow leopards. I just fi had finished my PhD uh, and I was studying a small antelope species in central India's plains, you know, forests in, a, in central India. And this species were very difficult to see. So people would say, oh, you know, you can't see it. How will you do a PhD? But then with the help of some statistics, some technology, I was able to do my PhD on that species. Just around the time I was finishing my PhD, the Snow Leopard Trust was looking for someone who had similar interests uh, and some maybe a small set of uh, uh, an interest in studying a species which is not that easy and the ability to deploy you know, technology and statistics. So I applied. It took them a while to decide that I was worth the, the job, but um, I, I definitely uh, I'm grateful that they uh, I got to work, uh, got to work on snow leopards ever since. Uh, but the 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 other side of it is that you know snow leopards have always intrigued uh, have have intrigued me and a lot of others just because of their ability to be so elusive yet so present and so powerful uh, and of course charismatic and look at this guy he's just so stunning. So yeah, they, they are a mix of beauty, power, agility, strength, uh, ca capabilities, and uh, a lot more. So that's that's something that has always fascinated me, and probably that's why I, uh, yeah, I've continued to work on snow leopards for how many years is now? It's almost 17 years now that I'm studying snow leopards. I'm working on snow leopards. Uh, we have an anonymous attendee who's asking, what route in your education did you take to get to where you are today? Very good question. And I've had a very interesting uh, roundabout. Uh, stop this and get to the video. Yeah. Uh, roundabout way education. I did my bachelor's with mathematics and physics. I even did my master's in physics. Uh, then I got an opportunity to work with an organization which uh, which was looking for someone who wanted to take the risk of studying a difficult to study species and that's where i ended up studying this four horned antelope in central india uh, and that's what got me a phd in wildlife zoology so i was able to make that little, little transition from physics to uh, ecology and that's where i did my phd in wildlife zoology and uh, ever since I've been with uh, snow leopards. So yeah, it's, as I said, in the uh, somewhere during my talk, I mentioned that it, you don't really have to, uh, to be only a biologist to be able to do your work. You can be quite a few, you can be whatever you are and have the passion and the interest and still come in and do incredible work. We have people who in the past worked as uh, software engineer helping snow leopard conservation. We have uh, accounts, accountants working, helping snow leopard conservation. We have business people who, who know how to do business. They're helping with snow leopard conservation. So it's really, you know, the sky is the limit. There's no real definition of what education you should follow to be able to, uh, to, uh, to conserve biodiversity. You can make a contribution from uh, uh, in, in, in whichever way possible from uh, different uh, from different routes. Uh, we have an an another anonymous attendee uh, who's asking your study areas seem to be across many different countries, many in what appears to be dangerous areas. Uh, does your group of scientists run into problems with some of the politics in these countries? Yes and no. Um, it's always important that you respect the rule of law. It's always important that you understand the the risks and the uh, and the challenges that you are going to face when you're out in the field. Uh, and it's always important to respect the local people who 
who this these areas belong to. So if you if you take care of some of those elements and some of those issues, uh, you can be all right. But yes, there are areas which could be very high risk, and we we might just want to wait till the high risk is slightly lower risk before uh, you know trying to venture. But uh, but again, I mean, I'm 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 in awe of the researchers and conservationists who work in some of these difficult countries and are doing incredible work, which is really helping conserve these species um, in places that would have otherwise been drawn a complete blank in terms of us knowing nothing about what's happening there, what are the need, conservation needs, and how species can be conserved. I hope that answers your question. If not, please feel free to write back. Mm, we have one more question from Nick, Nick, Nicole Lucas. Uh, Lucas, uh, sorry if I'm pronouncing it wrong. Uh, Okay, Gigi would like to know what are the main causes of snow leopard deaths and are snow leopards still endangered? So snow leopards can die because of various reasons. Of course, I'm keeping aside the natural death, which is you know falling off a cliff or getting old and dying or having a fight with another snow leopard and getting killed or being killed by another predator like a you know, pack of wolves. Uh, the biggest threats to snow leopard populations are when they are killed by uh, people who are upset about them killing their livestock. They are they are threatened by people who kill them to sell their beautiful skin and pelt to international uh, illegal international markets, uh, and and they're sold everywhere. You know there are there are times they have been exported from some of the snow leopard range to North America. They have been exported to Europe. They have been exported periodically to uh, Eastern Europe or Western uh, Asia as well, Middle, uh, Cent uh, Middle East regions as well. So that's another key threat. They're also known of late, there have been deaths recorded by collisions with fast moving cars in some areas uh, where there never used to be fast moving cars. Now, suddenly they are fast moving cars and in absence of appropriate mitigation measures, there are times they can die of accidents as well. But broadly speaking, these are the three or four main reasons which uh, which can kill them, which can hurt them, which is why it's important to work towards reducing these threats. Uh, the second part of the question was, are snow leopards still endangered? So snow leopards are still threatened by extinction. They come under a category called vulnerable to extinction. It's one notch less than endangered, uh, but then there is a group of scientists who believe that it's still endangered and not really one notch down, but then others believe that it's uh, endangered. But, but yes, they are threatened by extinction. They're vulnerable to, uh, to uh, extinction. Natalia would like to know, how are you able to place the cameras? So we basically try to find snow leopards um, insta rocks you know you know instagram you know facebook if uh, i'm not saying you should be using those but i'm sure you you know about them now how do you communicate with a lot of friends who you don't really get to see you put out a wall posting or you put out a picture as an instagram uh, post and then your friends interact like and you know respond or comment on it similarly snow leopards find these Insta rocks or these Facebook uh, or scrapebook wall posting uh, uh, places. They go, they spray their urine, they rub their cheek, uh, which also has glands and uh, uh, secretes uh, certain hormones uh, and uh, pheromones, sorry, not hormones, but pheromones. And these are communications that snow leopards leave behind saying that, you know, it could be a it could be a girl snow leopard leaving a message, I'm looking for a boyfriend. Or it could be another male snow leopard saying, stay out, this is my area. Or it could be a young snow leopard looking around, ooh, these are the big boys in this area, let me quietly, uh, you know, quietly evade encountering them or I'll get beaten up. So there could be any of these messages and that's how they, they interact. So what we do is we try to find out those rocks and those places where snow leopards would typically interact with other snow leopards and their 
reasonably easy to find out. And then that's where we set out our camera traps. We put little rocks, we tie them on, uh, we tie the cameras, and then we walk in front of the camera like a snow leopard so that it's properly aligned. And then we just leave the cameras there and then they take uh, they do the job for us. Uh, let me know if that answered your question. If, you, if not, then let me know what else you would like to know. Uh, we have someone with the name Skilang. Uh, if a high school student was considering a local project regarding wildlife camera capture data, how would you suggest they begin? Oh, well, these camera traps are not very inexpensive. So you, you have to first figure out a way to be able to procure them. Uh, and then, I mean, these cameras, you know, I've, I've known people putting them in their backyard. I have actually a couple in my uh, my parental house in central India, and they often record uh, cats walking about around. Sometimes, once I think one of them recorded a snake. Was it? No, not a snake, but a but a big monitor lizard walking around. So you can actually put these cameras in the in your backyard if you have one, uh, or in a neighboring area, and they can collect some fantastic images that you can uh, show to your friends and family. Um, and then each each of these encounters, you can even put them for birds. And if you put them for birds, and if it records some birds, you can use that data and contribute to platforms such as eBird, who can then use your information to understand the bird distribution patterns and how those patterns are changing, let's say with climate change and other such uh, human-induced uh, parameters, factors. Okay, uh, we have uh, three more minutes. Um, a high, if a high school student was considering a local project regarding whether, uh, how would you, okay, I think I've answered that one, sorry. Uh, what kind of education schooling do you need in order to have your job? I just mentioned, explained that. I hope it answered. If not, please feel free to write again. Um, the next one is snow leopards seem too elusive. Are people encroaching on their territories? The territories seem so inhospitable to humans. Surprisingly enough, they are. People are encroaching in some of these areas. People have lived in these areas, but with better technology, with better access uh, to equipment, we are now you know, making roads in some of these areas where they never were. We're mining in some of these areas where we've never mined before. So there's a lot of human access which is happening in addition to what already the interface was uh, between the two. Uh, Brianna is asking, what is the difference between your new role with the Snow Leopard Trust compared to what you did previously? So previously, I used to spend a lot of time in the field and I used to do a lot of, uh, you know, I used to be sort of uh, helping out uh, with the research implementation. Now I get to work with a lot of highly skilled and uh, intelligent people and learn from them about what they are doing. So I'm now able to work with a much bigger group of people in my new 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 position. And that that uh, that's very exciting. I get to learn a lot of new things. At the same time, I'm able to share whatever little knowledge I have with them as well. So the scope of my interaction with people has broadened in my new position. And that's something I'm very thrilled about and very fortunate and grateful for. How many snow leopards are in zoos around the world? Uh, the number is somewhere between 450 and 500. That's how many snow leopards are there across uh, zoos in the world. Uh, we do work with a lot of these zoos uh, for some um, ex situ research. You know, how does a snow leopard behave or get photographed on a certain camera trap? What could be the challenges, errors, and so on? So we do some research with those captive animals. But we also uh, work closely with them in partnerships. Zoos provide support to do some conservation work in the field as well. So there are multiple levels of partnerships with these uh, zoos. Done. Uh, done. I have done encroaching. Yeah, that's done. Uh, what is a snow leopard lifespan? How? Okay, that's a very good question. We have one publication which uh, we were able to where we were able to estimate that snow leopards typically live around 8 to 10 11 years that's rough approximately their lifespan in the wild 
in captivity they can live longer because they don't get they get taken care of even after you know they they're too old to hunt or they you know they're too old to not hunt not only hunt but even defend their territory but in the wild about 8 to 12 years is roughly uh, how long they live how many are left in the world in the wild we suspect there could be anywhere between 3 and a half to 7000 this number could be off on either side but that's how many snow leopards are there in the world I mean, I have, I usually ex explain this in a very in a silly way. Think of a snow leopard as a grain of rice. If the whole world's wild snow leopards, if you put, if they are rice grains, you put them in a cup, you will fill up half a cup. That's how many snow leopards we have. Compare that to human population. If one human, one person is a grain of rice, then you will have 700,000 cups that many humans are there. So that's how many humans and that's how few snow leopards are there. Um, China has the most snow leopards. Uh, Sycamore Trails, fourth grade. Yep. China has the most snow leopards. They have roughly 60% of the habitat of snow leopards across the world. That's in China. So uh, they have the most snow leopards, we suspect. Okay, I think we did very well on time. It's nine o'clock, uh, my time. Uh, I don't know what's time. What's the time? Is it nine o'clock there as well? Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah, it is. Perfect. Excellent. So I think we did very well on time. Thank you so much for those questions. If you have any more questions, feel free to reach out to me uh, on any of the media. You can reach out to the organizers and they'll be happy. They'll hopefully be happy to connect you with me as well. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sharma, for that great presentation. And thank you for dedicating your time over there. I know it's a little late there, so uh, thank you for being there. And me and Arun had a question on where you got that great shirt from. Oh, this one? Yeah. So, this one, <laughs> so there's a company called uh, For the Love of All Things, Float. Every year, they, they, they release a new design of these snow leopard shirts once in the spring and once in the autumn. Uh, so if you keep an eye on their, on, on their new release of a design, I think the next one will be coming in a couple of months. So the problem is they don't repeat a good, the same design. And some of these designs oh, are so God. nice. I really want the design again, but yeah. you know, this is the only shirt I have and I'll never have another one of these shirts. <laughs> yeah, so you, you can follow them and they give a, a substantial portion of the earnings to conservation as well. So oh, yeah, you can buy those t-shirts for a good cost too. <laughs> thank you. We'll definitely check that out. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Dr. Sharma. Thank you, Dr. Sharma. Thank you so much. A pleasure talking to you all and all the best for the rest of the yeah. NatBio teaching sessions. Take care. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Oh.